Let's pray and we'll get into the Word this morning. Father, we thank you for really the blessing of having this facility here to, to use in, in the light of what's going on in our regular space. And so, Father, we just thank you for provision. We thank you for favor. Thank you for favor with the folks that uh, control the property here. And we thank you, Father, for just the ability to come and receive from your word today. We believe that this will be a blessing and will be instructive. And we intend to receive from your Holy Spirit, who is the teacher. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to talk about something uh, <laughs> that we've talked about before, but in a very different light. Uh, we've talked about the teaching that has been going around the body of Christ that is incorrect concerning grace. But today we're going to talk about grace from a biblical perspective. And uh, I want us to get into a little bit of a study of grace here and trust that you'll see some things that uh, uh, maybe you haven't seen before about the term grace. Um, let's go to... Um, we don't have our, our wall Bible. Don't even have our wall. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we're really going to have to wing it today. But just follow along in your regular Bible. Praise the Lord. All right, grace, first of all, we understand that grace is unmerited favor. We've heard that taught for many, many years. We know that grace is um, from God. And, and what I want to really look at today is that grace is favor. Favor and grace are actually interchangeable, particularly in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. Grace and favor are interchangeable terms. Now, before I get started, let me kind of reiterate that the kind of grace teaching that's going on today in the body of Christ, unfortunately, what I call the greasy grace message, uh, just to catch everybody's attention, uh, that kind of grace teaching basically says that, and there's, again, with any element of, of deception, there's truth in there, okay? There's got to be a grain of truth or people wouldn't bite, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so the element of truth that is true in, in this teaching is that Jesus did it all. There's no question that Jesus did it all, okay? Uh, he, he died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. He is ascended to the Father, and now he intercedes for us. And through his sacrifice and everything that he did, we have everything that we have here in this life and in the world to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no question that that is true. The problem with the Greasy Grace teaching is they take it to an extreme teaching that says because Jesus did it all, then there's nothing for man to do at all, including receiving him as Lord. So in other words, everybody's saved, everybody's going to heaven, uh, there's nothing you can do to please God, and there's nothing you can do to uh, displease God, everybody's going to get blessed. And there's nothing, we, even, we don't even need to really be in faith, you know, because God's just going to dump it on us. That's the greasy grace teaching. That's where they get into error, because the Bible is very clear that God does show favor, which is grace, which is what we're talking about, to those who obey. Well, if there's no obedience required, which is what the greasy grace teaching is, then that basically says that that, Scripture that talks about the fact that uh, we receive grace and favor when we obey is gone. It's wrong. And, of course, what they're willing to do, <clears throat> uh, more often than not, is just throw the Bible out. Well, you know, we don't need the Bible anymore. We just go by what's in our spirit. Well, you can't throw the Bible out. You know, it's like the old saying about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You don't do that. <laughs> you keep... What is the treasure? In this case, the baby, which is the Word of God. The Word of God is our treasure. It is something that we stand on. It's something that we are obedient to. So let's look at um, Psalm 512. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. Remember the word favor and grace are interchangeable. With favor wilt thou compass him with a shield. Now I like this view of grace. I like this thought process of a shield. Most of you know that I'm into science fiction. I enjoy 
science fiction, I enjoy Star Trek. And in that particular mythology, they have what's called a shield that goes around the ship. And if you attack that ship from any side, any angle, it's like a bubble. It's encased in this shield. Well, we are surrounded by a shield of favor as believers. And we need to believe for that. We need to stand in faith for that. We're going to find out more as we go through this about actually believing to receive this favor. But if you consider that you have a shield around you, a constant shield of favor, and once we talk about the importance of favor, you'll see how it really is something that we do not want to ne neglect in our lives. Um, let's look at Proverbs 11:27 briefly. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor. Now think about that. He that diligently seeketh good procures favor, or you receive favor. So favor can be received because of something you do. Okay? If you diligently, and notice it's, it's really not even enough to just seek good. You diligently seek good. You apply yourself to seek good. And if you do that, you will procure favor. The latter part of that scripture says, He that seeketh mischief, <laughs> it shall come to him. <laughs> well, that's true too. There's always a reciprocal of, of these kinds of things. Let's go down to... Uh, I'm going to read a couple of other scriptures real quick. We won't take a lot of time to talk about them specifically, but Proverbs 12, 2 says, A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord. So favor comes from the Lord. Um, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. Proverbs 13, 5, 15 says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressors is hard. We've talked about the latter part of that verse before, the way of a transgressor is hard. If you transgress against the Word of God, you're going to have a hard time. And, and the greasy grace crowd, of course, would say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what you do. Well, it does if the way of the transgressor is hard. If you're going to transgress and the Bible says it's hard, that's the way it is, okay? So we don't want to do that. We, we have a choice not to do that. Let's uh, go to Acts 4.33. This is kind of the key to what I want us to see today. Acts 4.33, talking about the early church and what was going on with them. This kind of summarizes everything that was going on in the early church. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, and grace is favor, remember, great grace was upon them all. Well, let's think about that term great grace. If you can have great grace, you can have a little grace. Okay? In other words, grace, this is what I want us to see, grace is quantifiable and quantitative. Big words. But basically means you can measure grace. You can measure amounts of grace. And God gives grace by amount. Because if he can give great grace, he could potentially give less grace. So the amount, remember we found out that you get grace when you are diligently seeking good. So if you just kind of, eh, you're not that diligent. But you seek good, you're not, you know, you're not out there doing bad, but you, you're, you're pro-good, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you might get a little grace, okay? But if you diligently seek grace, if you really go for it, then you get great grace. Now, let's think about grace and what it means to us. We know that we're saved strictly because of grace, because we apply faith to receive the grace. Okay? See, that's how it works. Grace and faith are tightly connected. It is very difficult sometimes to, to kind of make the difference between them, but the best way to look at it is grace is God's willingness to bless us Faith is the power and the force by which we appropriate the grace. The grace is there. And as a matter of fact, one of the key things about grace is grace for salvation is available to everyone. There is no one on the earth that the grace for salvation is not available to. But there are gracings for other things. I mean, Paul, for instance, talked about how he ministered according to the grace that was given unto him. 
the ability and the functioning of the ministry in his life, the spiritual gifts and so forth that operated in his life, was based on the gracing of God that was given to him. So that tells us there could be different kinds of grace. Gracings, you see what I'm saying? Now, grace in general is favor. Grace in general is good. You can say all those kinds of things about it. But we're getting a little specific here about the grace of God specifically. There are gracings concerning uh, ministry. There are gracings concerning uh, favor in, in your job, in your life, in your family. All right, so let's look at, uh, oh, let's see, where do we want to go from there? Let's look at John 1.16, talking about Jesus here. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Now, I like what the Amplified says here. I'm going to read it down to the Amplified. For out of his fullness or abundance we have all received, all had a share, and we were all supplied with one grace after another. One grace after another. And spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and favor upon favor, and gift heaped upon gift. You see that? In other words, God will grace you with something, but he then may turn around and grace you with something else. He may grace you with a gift, then he may turn around and grace you with another gift. It's, it can be cumulative. Okay, so grace can be a little grace, or it can be great grace. It can be layered grace upon grace. It can be uh, ad added to, additional. <laughs> okay, so we've got qualitative, quantitative, and the capability of on top of grace, or adding to grace. So we're beginning to see there's, there's something to this grace maybe that we haven't uh, seen as clearly before. Romans 5, 2, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So how do we get into this grace by which we stand? By faith. So we're not saying that grace takes the place of faith. Again, the greasy grace crowd kind of takes that approach. Well, we don't really need to talk about faith so much because after all, we were under grace. So it's like, as long as we got grace, we don't need faith. No, we have grace, praise the Lord, but we access it by faith. Faith's what turns on the switch. So without the faith, you don't have access to the grace. But here it says uh, that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All right, let's go to Psalm 119.57. Uh, Psalm 119.57 says, Thou art my portion, O Lord, I have said that I would keep thy words. Notice, keep thy words, or word. I entreated thy favor, or grace, with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me, or grace me, According to thy word, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I thought on my ways, I turned my feet toward the word. That's what the testimonies are, the word. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Now, I've taught this before, and in teaching it, brought out the point that the word commandment, in the Greek actually, is talking about authoritative prescriptions authoritative prescriptions. And I use the example of a doctor who prescribes a particular medicine to treat a particular symptom. You know, he's tested you and he's run tests and he's found something and he needs to treat that particular symptom. And so he prescribes a drug of some kind. Now you go to the drugstore and most people don't take the prescription that he's given them that they have in their hand to the drugstore and go, oh man, I really don't want this. Why did the doctor force me to get this? No, you went to the doctor to get his authoritative prescription. Then you got the prescription and got it filled. And if you take it according to the way he has prescribed it, it is beneficial to you. Okay? So commandments are not bad for us. They're only bad for us if we have the wrong attitude about them. 
See, the commandments of God, according to the Scripture in 1 John, are not grievous. That means they're not hard, they're not mean. God's not trying to just, you know, berate us and, and push us down. He's trying to lift us up. His authoritative prescriptions are given for our benefit. The doctor gives you that medicine for your benefit, not for his benefit, for your benefit. So you want to take that authoritative prescription and get better. Well, same thing with the Word of God, with the commandments of God. We want to do the commandments of God, first of all, because it pleases Him. I mean, that's enough right there. But also because it's for our good. He doesn't tell us to do something that isn't for our good. But if we delay not to keep His commandments, we put ourselves in a position where we receive favor. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. I sought after favor with my whole heart by keeping his commandments. Psalm 89, 17 says, For thou art the glory of their strength, and thy favor, in thy favor, our horn shall be exalted. Now, that's a little blind to us in the King James, I gotta admit. But listen to it out of the complete Jewish Bible. It's a very unusual translation, but I love this translation. For you, this is Psalm 89, 17. For you yourself are the strength in which they glory. Our power grows by pleasing you. Woo! I love that. Our power grows by pleasing the Lord. Why? Because he graces us with more. Now, think about what grace means, after all. The gracings that God gives us. If you have a problem that you're dealing with, let's say you have a particular habit or something, and you've been dealing with it, and you've been dealing with it, and you've been trying your best to overcome it, and it just seems like you've been having a lot of problems with that area. What would happen if you got more grace in that area? Would it get easier to deal with it or less easy? It'd get easier. The more grace you had in that area, the easier it would be to deal with it. Some habit, some problem. You, if you got grace in that area, you wouldn't have as much problem with that. So seeking after something that would benefit us, grace us more, is going to be beneficial to us. It's going to help us. And that's what he's talking about. Our power grows as we seek his grace. So we need to be seeking his grace because we want these things in our lives dealt with. And you know, a lot of times you feel like I'm dealing with this thing you know, kind of out in the cold. I, I'm having to be the one to deal with it. Well, you want the Lord to get involved. Yeah. So how do you get him involved? Obey the commandments. Do Seek good diligently. Go after the good. Go after the word. Put the word first place. Meditate on the word and your grace will increase and it will become easier to deal with some of these things. It's, it's just excited me when I begin to see this. Now, let me say this. This teaching I originally heard and am still listening to from uh, Keith Moore, Pastor Keith Moore. He has a tremendous teaching on this on his website. I encourage you to go check his website out and look at his teaching concerning grace. It's some of the most powerful teaching I've ever heard. And he brought out some of these things and as he did, I thought, wow, this is what the body of Christ needs. We need to hear the true teaching concerning grace, which is exactly what he's doing. He's, he's kind of countering the bad teaching about grace with good teaching about grace. Same thing Pastor did. Yeah. You know, when he was teaching on grace, after that whole thing hit about the, this bad teaching. So you start seeing the importance of it. It's just amazing. Uh, let's go to, wow. Um, I'm going to back up just a tad here to something I was looking at. Let's go to Romans 12, 6. Having then gifts, remember we were talking about gracings, gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. In other words, the, the, minute, the gifts and, 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 and so forth that God's given you, he's given it to you as gracings. Another important thing to realize about the word grace in the New Testament is 
it's the Greek word charis. It's the word that we use, uh, that's the root word of charismatic. And a lot of people say, you know, what are you? Well, I'm a charismatic. What does that mean? Typically, the word charis is translated as a spiritual gift. Well, grace is charis. Charis is grace. So spiritual gifts are gracings of God that he's given us to minister to other people. Most of the time, that's what it's for. You know, obviously, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, that is something that is for you, between you and the Lord, when you're praying in the Holy Ghost. But the gift of tongues in a public assembly, when you pray or you uh, say something forth in tongues and then you interpret it, then that is equivalent to prophecy in a public meeting. So that's a, a ministry gift as opposed to a personal gift that tongues would be in, in, you know, with regard to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in both cases, it's charis. Both cases, it's a gifting. It's a gracing. We've been graced with a gift. So, as it says here, we have gifts differing. In other words, I may minister in a gift of healing. You may minister in prophecy. We have gifts differing according to the grace, the charis, that is given to us. So there's different gracing. So the grace can be greater or less. It can be layered one on top of the other. It can be added to, and it can be specific as a type of grace, a gifting or a, 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 an operation. You know, the Holy Spirit operates differently in different people. All right, verse uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant, there's another quantitative word, abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redoubt to the glory of God. So again, we see abundant grace. We see great grace. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound, there's that word abound again, toward you, that you having all sufficiency, now notice that, if you have great grace and it abounds to you, what do you have? You have all sufficiency. We saw earlier, when you had grace, you had power. When you have grace, you have ability. When you have grace, you have a gifting. So grace is something we need to seek after, and we can believe for and pray concerning. All right, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 14, And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. So we can pray for grace. Uh, every one of us is given grace. This is Ephesians 4, 7. Every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So, according to the measure of the gift of Christ, you are graced. I'm going to quickly go some, through some of these others. 1 Timothy 1, 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. The grace of our Lord is exceeding abundant. Abundant. There's that increase again. With faith, and faith works by love, so with love, which is in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 4.10, As every man hath received the gift, the charis, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now the, the phrase or term there, manifold grace, means it's like a lot of different kinds of grace, a lot of different kinds of giftings. So I wanted to give you some of these things to see that grace is not just a, a single thing, a single operation. Uh, let's go to uh, some points here that I wanted to make about grace. I'm kind of speeding through this. It's probably a several week study, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a lot quickly and you can go study it out. <laughs> First of all, let's go back to the point that grace is free and unmerited for salvation. Free and unmerited and it's for salvation for everyone. In other words, God may grace different people with different gifts as he chooses, but salvation's for everyone. Okay, we establish that. We see this in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, by grace are you saved through receiving it by faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So, nobody can boast about the fact that there's grace available for salvation. It's for everyone. Okay? It's available. And you 
you lay hold on that by faith. Grace is available to all for salvation, Titus 2, 11 through 12. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Pretty clear. Now, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Notice that the grace teaches us that we should deny ungodliness, deny worldly lusts, live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. Isn't that interesting? And yet it's this greasy grace crowd that says, don't worry about being ungodly or whatever. Don't worry about worldly lust. Just ignore all that because God doesn't care. You know, like the pastor gave the example of a couple that's living together and comes to their pastor and says, you know, we want you to help us with our uh, uh, problems, you know, inter interpersonal relations. And he's like, well, you guys aren't even married. Don't you think that's a problem? Oh, no, we're under grace. No, grace is not an excuse for sin. Yeah. Matter of fact, the scripture's clear about that. It says, should we sin more? Now, I'm going to paraphrase a little here. Mm -hmm. So that grace abounds? God. No, God forbid. So this whole attitude that people have about grace, scripturally, is totally wrong. So we need to understand that and go with that. All right, grace is given progressively. We have access to all of God's grace. However, it's given to us as we have need of it and as we have responded to previous gracings, okay? Therefore, Peter urged believers to grow in grace. For, uh, 2 Peter 3, 18. So you can grow in grace. And he prayed that grace would be multiplied unto them. 2 Peter 1, 2. Grace can be multiplied. Well, if it can be multiplied, that's an increasing amount. And that's what I want us to see. Paul has, has, was assured that God's grace was sufficient for all that he was enduring... 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And we respond to the grace God gives us, and he gives us more grace. Therefore, different believers have different measures of these gracings. Okay? They're at different points in their life. They're at different points in obedience. They're at different points in understanding about the Word of God. And because of that, they are graced differently. Okay? So, but that, to me, that's good news, because that means I can increase my grace level. I can increase my favor level. Now one thing I do want to say before I, I go much further, and I was, I was going to say this earlier, and that is that grace operates in people that are gracious. Okay, that's a sailor moment there. <laughs> grace, favor, operates in those that are gracious or give favor. If you are a gracious person, if you give favor to others, grace will come upon you. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it works. Now, think about this. The Bible tells us that Moses was the meekest man in the earth at that time. Yeah. What does that mean, meek? See, a lot of people equate meek with weak. It, meek is not weak. No, not. As a matter of fact, meek is trusting in the Lord. I don't have to be strong in and of my own power personal power because I trust in the Lord. Now people may look at me and say, oh, he's, he's wishy-washy, he's weak. I've had people at work tell me that. Ah, you're just weak. No, I'm gracious, I'm kind, I prefer others, and the world sees that as weak. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's strength. Yes, it is. Because I have to deny my own <coughs> feeling that I have certain rights. You know, I've got the right to this and you can't transgress over that, blah, blah, blah. And you get combative. Well, when you get combative, you're not gracious. Mm -hmm. When you get combative, you're not favoring others. You're only looking out for yourself. And that's exactly the wrong attitude. But this is what Pastor Keith Moore said. Uh, he was praying about this early in his ministry. And the Lord showed him that verse of Scripture in the Old Testament where it said that Moses was the meekest of all men in his generation. And the Lord said this to Pastor Moore. He said, notice Moses was the meekest man in his generation. But notice also he was the most used man in his generation. Used of God. And, and Pastor Moore, this is early in his ministry, he was praying and saying, Lord, wh what can I do to operate more in, in the ministry you've given me? How do I function in it? And the Lord said, be meek in the biblical sense, not weak, 
but gracious. And he also gave an example that I really love too about uh, when he went to an airport one time and he was running late and his flight had been canceled. And all the flights going to this part of the country had been canceled. I don't know if it was weather or whatever, but for some reason these flights had been canceled. And people were coming up to the stand there, you know, where the guy was trying to deal with all this and they were cussing him and they were fussing at him and they were just tearing him down and you and Pastor Moore and his wife just standing there quiet and it came up to their turn and and Pastor Moore said that his wife was the first to say anything and she, she said sir I'm so sorry I've seen the way you've been treated I'm so sorry you're having a hard time I know it's not your fault uh, and he said well what do you want and she said, well, I just, you know, we just need to get where we're going, like all these other people, but is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> you know, is there anything I can do to help you? And the guy kind of looked at her funny like, well, what is this? And so they were kind, and they were gracious, and they were, they were not harsh, and they weren't demanding, and you know, I've got a ticket. You get me to my destination. They weren't that way. They were kind to this guy. And this guy just stops. He says, come with me. Well, they went down this little side way, you know, and as they walked off, everybody looked at them like daggers coming out of their eyes. I mean, man, what in the world? What's, what's up with these people? Well, they had favor. They had favor because they were gracious. He took them down this little hall, down this door that said authorized personnel only, took them through that, went out on the tarmac, walked them directly onto a plane and on that plane put them in first class. They didn't have first class tickets. Got on the plane, got there to their destination actually early, first class, because they were gracious. And they were surrounded by a shield of favor. You know, they were believing for favor. And that's exactly what they prayed there in the airport. They got off to themselves and said, Lord, we just believe for favor. You sent us to preach. We've got to make this meeting. There's folks gathered there waiting to, for us to preach. So. We just put it in your hands, and we know you'll still supply our need. Well, they had grace. They had favor. But, as he said, they only got it because they were gracious. They were kind. And it's the same thing with us. We need to realize if we're going to operate in favor, if we're going to have grace multiplied to us, we're going to have to be gracious to people. Think about Jesus. It says of Jesus, he was meek and lowly in heart. Well, that doesn't mean, you know, he was a sad sack. <laughs> it's not the point. But he thought of others first. He was always, what can I do to help the multitudes? Even at his saddest point when he lost John the Baptist, his, his first cousin, and he was mourning over that loss, and the, the multitude came to him. I mean, he could easily turn around and said, can't you leave me alone for one day? Let me mourn the loss of my family. But no, he ministered to them. He was gracious to them. And that alone was a greater strike against the devil than him going off in mourning. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the devil's the one who killed John the Baptist. And so in order to retaliate, you know, you get a knife or a gun or whatever and go after those people that did that. No, that's not what he did. He operated in love. He was gracious. He healed the sick. That was retaliation against the devil. The devil did not want that. So, we need to be gracious. Grace is given to the humble. And this is uh, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, or I'm, I'm sorry, James 4.6 first. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And then uh, 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Yea, all of you are subject one to another. Be ye clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and give grace to the humble. He gives this charis, this gracing, to those that are humble. And again, humble does not mean weak. Humble means that we look to God. The truly humble person is humble because they're looking to God. They know they don't have the power and authority within themselves, of themselves. They have the power and authority through God. That's true humility because you're looking to Him to supply the need rather than you having to deal with it yourself. Those people that always talk about I'm a self-made man, 
they're really talking in pride. You know, I'm not a self-made man. I'm a God-made man. You know, everything good in my life has come from the Lord. Everything that I have achieved, if you want to look at it that way, I didn't achieve. The Lord graced me with those positions and those opportunities and, those, and the favor and the wisdom and the knowledge and the abilities that I have. He's graced me with that. So that's true humility, to understand that yeah. and to realize that's how we grow, that's how we live, that's how we function in faith is by means of this grace. All right, the last few uh, things here. Do not try to abuse grace. Grace can be abused. And we really, because see, it's favor from God. And God is graciously giving us favor. But a lot of people want to take advantage of that. And that's where this greasy grace doctrine got off, is, quote, taking advantage of it. Since grace is given to overcome sin, some wrongly conclude that by sinning more, we receive more grace. And that's actually something that people thought back in the day when Paul wrote this to the Romans in uh, Romans 6, 1 through 2, he says, uh, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 1 through 2. He was dealing with this with the Romans, <laughs> the church that was at Rome. So it's not unusual. It's not different. It's not uh, unique that we see that. So don't live in sin thinking that that's going to increase grace. No, we've seen that living seeking good, living obeying the commandments, that's what increases grace. We've seen that from the scripture today. Now, last thought I want to leave with you here is by a Bible scholar. This is John Piper from a book that he wrote called Pleasures of God. Uh, and he said this, It is a great irony that the people who cultivate a two-stage Christianity do so in the name of grace, but in effect nullify grace. They say there is a faith stage necessary for getting to heaven, and then an obedience stage not necessary for getting to heaven, but perhaps for getting better rewards there. Underlying this mistake is a misunderstanding of grace. Grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned, Grace is the enabling gift of God to overcome sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. I like that. Grace is power, not just pardon. Remember we saw earlier in the, um, uh, the what it was, a complete Jewish Bible, where it said that our power is increased as we operate in grace. Yeah. We have more power when we operate in grace. So grace is power, not just pardon. So it, the, if you center up on, I'm pardoned, I can get away with anything, <laughs> which is, again, the greasy grace doctrine, that's totally wrong. No, I'm graced of God, therefore I have power to overcome sin. I am graced of God, therefore I have power to overcome this temptation or this habit or this issue that I'm dealing with. And the more grace I get, and the more I seek after good, the easier it's going to be to deal with that. So, praise the Lord. Did you get anything out of this today? Amen. Hallelujah. I tell you, there's more to it. <laughs> there's way more to it. So I encourage you to check out Keith Moore's website, Faith Life Church. Uh, I think he, uh, what's the other, he has several websites. Faith Life Church is one. And then More Life, morelife.com, uh, uh, I believe it is. Check that out because he's got some awesome, awesome teachings on this whole topic of grace, and it is a blessing. And I've been watching his programs. You know, he, he does his TV shows in such a way that he's usually several months behind what he's teaching at the church in order to do the programs and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's exciting to see this taught, so I encourage you to get into that. Mm -hmm.